All right, welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about atrial fibrillation and more specifically, what are the three most common mistakes or errors that I see during rounds when dealing with atrial fibrillation and what can we do perhaps to correct these errors, okay? So these are gonna be real quick and hopefully you get something out of them. The first thing is about rate control in atrial fibrillation. So rate control is always gonna be our number one goal in atrial fibrillation. And one of the more common mistakes I see people giving up front is when somebody's going very fast, 120s, 130s, 140s, and we're gonna assume right now that the patient is hemodynamically intact, which means they don't have hypoperfusion or active heart failure or active ischemia, in which case they'd need direct current cardioversion, is not giving enough IV medication up front, okay? So let's take diltiazem. Diltiazem is a very common IV medication. The most common mistake I see is not giving enough up front. So we'll give like five milligrams or 10 milligrams. And while everybody is different and we have to treat everybody uh, based on patient specifics, um, really, I, I think we need to be giving a little bit more up front than we, than we commonly do. So what I usually do is I'll give 20 milligrams of IV diltiazem up front, and I can repeat that in a certain amount of time. If I'm really worried about the patient, it's blood pressure, let's say, for example, giving this much, then I'll give them a little bit of fluid along with that, if necessary. But um, I, I think people need a little bit more um, IV medication up front in order to, to get them a little bit better under control, okay? Now, the second part of this is that when we put somebody on a diltiazem drip, is one of the more common mistakes that we make is we don't overlap the drip with an oral medication. So when somebody's heart rate is becoming a little bit um, better, a little under control with the diltiazem drip, then what commonly happens is that this drip will titrate off and the patient will go you know, X amount of time without any uh, rate controlling medication. So what we really wanna be doing is we wanna be overlapping, overlapping our drip as it's coming down with an oral medication before we take this drip off and before it, 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 it's turned off. And that'll ensure that the patient's rate can, uh, stays under control, okay? The second thing, uh, and the second part of atrial fibrillation is using the Hasblit score correctly. So when we talk about anticoagulation in settings of AFib, there are really three things that we should be talking about. What's the stroke risk? We use the chads to vask What's the bleeding risk? And we can use the Hasblood score for this. And then which oral anticoagulant should I put this patient on? Here's a hint, it should be a DOAC in the majority of patients, okay? So the Hasblood score is a scoring system that you can utilize that tells me you know, how high, of the, uh, how high of risk is this patient for bleeding? But the mistake that I see patients or that I see um, residents make is we use this Hasblood score to say the Hasblood score is really high. I don't think that this patient should be on anticoagulation. It's just too high of a risk. When really what we should be saying is the Hasblood score is high, it's elevated, but that just means that this patient should have very close follow-up with the primary care physician with his or her primary care physician to discuss patient specific factors that could be improved that would lower the has blood score that would prevent um, bleeds okay so really if the patient should be on anticoagulation we use that chance to vask for that and then we just use this has blood score to say we need follow-up i'm going to message that primary care doctor i'm going to send a message to the primary care doctor i'll call the primary care doctor and say hey you know putting them on anticoagulation a little bit of follow-up would, um, would be necessary, okay? The third one is using aspirin monotherapy for anticoagulant prophylaxis or stroke prophylaxis. So I'm gonna point you to a couple of trials. There's the active A trial, and this looked at aspirin versus aspirin plus clopidogrel in the setting of atrial fibrillation, and the active W trial, which looked at warfarin versus aspirin plus clopidogrel. But Really, aspirin monotherapy, we just don't have enough high quality data to say that aspirin is 
um, sufficient for stroke prophylaxis and really in any patient population, okay? So if they meet criteria for anticoagulant, for an anticoagulant, really what we should be doing is a DOAC. This is gonna be your preferred medication, okay? Now there are four DOACs out there, um, and I want you to be familiar with all of them, but DOACs are gonna be uh, preferred to warfarin for patients who uh, meet criteria for that. Aspirin monotherapy really is gonna, is falling out of favor, so I don't wanna see anybody on aspirin monotherapy for patients that should be. Even if their bleeding risk is really, really high, and you think that they should be on that, or their chads to vasc is low, but you wanna put them on something, really it should be a DOAC for them. Here's another pearl, um, we commonly see commercials, valvular atrial fibrillation. This is an indication when warfarin would be preferred to a DOAC. What valvular atrial fibrillation means is they have a mechanical heart valve or a moderate to severe mitral valve stenosis. That's valvular atrial fibrillation, and that's a setting where warfarin would be preferred, okay? So to recap, rate control, make sure you give enough IV diltiazem up front, 20 milligrams in the majority of your patients, has to be patient by patient, I get that, but you wanna give enough to get it under control. If you go to a drip, make sure that you overlap oral, um, oral medication when that drip is coming down so that the patient always has some sort of a rate control agent in their system. Utilize the has blood score correctly. Don't let it deter you from starting anticoagulant uh, prophylaxis if they meet criteria for that. And then let's not use uh, aspirin uh, monotherapy for prophylaxis. Let's use DOACs. If they don't want a DOAC, then they can do warfarin. If they don't want either of those, aspirin plus clopidogrel is going to be your last option. But these are going to be your medications. Okay? All right. Thanks, everyone.